I will start talking a little bit about how we build in timber in Sweden, a little bit about the development of wood timber engineering and how we, we do it in Sweden at the moment. And uh, I'll say something about myself. I work at our research institute of Sweden called RISE nowadays, which is a governmentally owned research institute. With, we uh, do work for the whole um, technically um, industry in Sweden. But one of these is of course the timber building industry. With, so we have the aim to uh, strengthen the competitiveness and innovation with about 2,800 employees. And for me, I am a senior researcher in wood building technology. I've been working with wood building and wood material questions for uh, two decades now or something like that. So I'm mainly uh, re responsible for larger research projects in uh, timber engineering. And what I'll be talking about today is um, Sweden and how we build with timber and the history and then which kind of building systems we use in Sweden today and which areas where we work on development. And then I'll end up with a little bit about how we work together with the industry for, and society to increase the speed of innovations within the area of uh, wood building. Within in this uh, innovation arena we call smart housing small lot. It says a few words about that, how, how we can work with development. And if we look into Sweden and building with timber here, uh, Sweden is a country far up in the north, in the north part of Europe, with quite a large country for Europe, but it's just one seventh of Australia. But if we look into Swedish forestry, if you see this map of Sweden, the dark green areas you see is forests. And from that, we can see that we have a lot of forest cover in Sweden. So that's an important industry for the country. Pine and spruce mainly. And it's about 10% of our national export value, which is in the forest industry. So it's an important area, not just building, but also pulp and paper and so on. Uh, so on timber. Uh, but, and that also means that we have a long history of building with timber. We have timber bridges that we still use for road traffic from the uh, 18th century. And we have one of the largest buildings in uh, Sweden, four-story building. And we have uh, buildings that are from 800 years old. So we have built a lot in timber and quite large structures also uh, historically. But as many countries in Europe, we had city fires in the 1880s or something like that. And then we changed uh, our national building code. So it was not allowed to build more than two stories in combustible materials. And that ban uh, was valid for almost 100 years until 1994. It's now 25 years, 27 years ago, since that regulation was changed. And that mean, meant that we could build in timber for more than two stories again. And from then on, we had a lot of development in timber engineering. And so today we build a lot in timber. Uh, single family houses has almost always been built in timber. Uh, the market share there is 85, 90%, something like that in timber. But from all the story, we didn't build anything up until 1994 when the first five story building was built. And from then on, we have gone on to build a lot. Today, there's a lot of other things besides residential buildings that's also built in timber. That's the schools, uh, offices, public buildings, some timber bridges, not that many, mainly for uh, walking and cycling and sports arenas, which we have built during all the times. And this is mainly due to a lot of research and development that has happened during these 25 years in many areas. But if we look into just residential buildings, here we can see the red curve is the ratio of buildings of all apartments that has been built in Sweden during the last 
15 years almost, where we used to build about 10% of all buildings, residential multi-story buildings in uh, wood, which has in the last couple of years increased to 20% of all buildings. Uh, you can also see that the number of apartments that's built in timber structures has increased. It has quadrupled in a few years. So it's built quite a lot of apartments for the Swedish market, at least today in timber. Uh, so that's a little bit about the history of this. If we then move over to how do we build in timber, we can say that we have several ways of buildings. This is something, new, but just to show that we use all types of uh, wood products from sawn timber to glue lamb. We have cross laminated timber today. Uh, we use laminated veneer lumber, even if it's not produced in Sweden. And we also have some of these lightweight timber systems with eye joists. And they will be used a little bit different, which we will see here. And in principle, we have three main building systems for multi story buildings. We have the one that we have always used uh, for all one family houses, the stud frames, sawn timber and uh, sheet materials. Uh, um, could be wood uh, sheet materials, OSB or plywood, but also a lot of gypsum boards in this. So this is the technique that comes from building one family houses and is now used also in multi-story buildings. Uh, but in the last couple of decades, we have also moved over a lot to using planner elements, which is mainly CLT. And we have some glue and beam column system as well that is used as uh, building systems. And what they are, these wood products are used in a little bit different ways. So there are a little bit difference in the building systems that is actually used and how it's done. And we can, in principle, share, uh, split this into two groups. We have our stud frames, this lightweight timber system that is very much used for industrial off-site productions, either as these volumetric elements that you see down to the left, or could be planner elements, where you can see that they are quite uh, well finished. Uh, this is often done by the suppliers they're coming from the one family house building, which has used this technique for many years and has now gone up to produce complete building and multi-story buildings as well. Uh, they often do the whole business themselves. Uh, they do everything from more or less buying the land until there is a finished house by themselves and sold by their, in their own brand name. There are, uh, there are other ways to do it, but that's a very uh, large part of this. And then we have these two post and beam and the massive timber or the planner elements in CLT. Uh, here, our wood producing companies uh, deliver the material in pre cut and so on, but uh, delivering it to the building site, just the load bearing system and then it assembled and completed by a contractor in much the same way as is traditionally done with a concrete building. So there in that part of the market, there's a lot more actors involved in the process. And if we look into these stud frames, here you see some examples to the right of building projects. Yeah. They are, at the moment, the larger part of this, they, are, they have about 70 to 80% of the market for residential timber frame buildings, multi-story buildings. Uh, can build up to five stories. Uh, it's possible to go, they go, in some cases, they go up to six stories. Uh, can also say that this, in a country like Sweden, with quite a lot of land, is the main part of the building stock we, will be just up to five, six stories. Uh, they have a lot high pre prefabrication time uh, and it's prefabricated in factories, which means that they are delivered to the building site in a very finished state. So it's a short time on the building site then. Uh, and 
up to six stories, yes. And depending on the system we need here, it might be necessary to actually use a weather protection on the building site, as you see down on the right, where they have a tent over the construction to make sure it's not, uh, we don't get any problem with rain during the building time. And that's mainly used when we use these 2D elements, planner elements, which are quite finished, as you see on the element up there. Uh, and this is what a factory for this looks like. If you look at the left, where you have your quite automated process, where they build plan, you make planner elements using a lot of uh, industrialized thinking, getting them up to finish the walls, and then uh, join them together to these 3D volumes, which are finished on the inside with windows, with bathroom and flooring and so on. So they and often also finished with the facade on the outside, as you can see in the example to the right, where they are lifting modules into place, more or less finished. And it goes very fast when they start to erect the building on the building site. Yeah. And here you can see also some examples of finished buildings showing that it's possible to get very different architectural impression from them from the outside, depending on how you make them. Even if you have these boxes, uh, you can make them very different on the outside. Uh, if we go over to this massive timber systems, we have the CLT walls here. Uh, today, they often arrive to the building site uh, clean like this with just the timber, the CLT element but with pre-cut windows and doors and so on. Uh, so this is a product that's about 20 years old. Uh, we actually used to import a lot of this from Central Europe, but in the last few years, they have uh, built out the capacity in enormous way in Sweden. We have, we have actually today four plants producing CLT from uh, Swedish timber as well. And uh, it's this is often used for a little bit higher buildings. And uh, we can build up to, it says 12 stories here. That's what we build quite often. Uh, but it's possible to build even higher with this system. And here you can see also here some examples from different types of buildings. Uh, with quite uh, free forms on these buildings. The building you see to the right is actually a round building on the outside. So here you have a little bit more freedom in it. Uh, often six, eight stories as you see here. Uh, there also is a system developed using post and beam structures in glue lemons, the beam column, how you call it. Uh, this is the system that is used in the building that's today is the tallest building in the world, which is the Mjöstornet in Norway. It's 18 stories. Uh, this is uh, developed by these Glula manufacturers that has a long experience building large uh, buildings, sports arenas and bridges. So they often stabilize this with truss systems in uh, Glula. And then you, of course, you get just your beam column uh, system, you have a lot of um, completion to do on the building site with walls. And the walls are often prefabricated as well and just put into place here. Uh, so there are a few uh, manufacturers of this kind of system as well. And here you can see some examples of building like this, where both finished and during construction. And if you look closely at the building down to the right here, this is a building that's built with uh, glue lamp post and beam structure. Next to this building, you have a building that looks exactly the same, but built in CLT. So on the outside, you won't see the difference. You can build very uh, different types of buildings on the inside of the building system, but they will look the same on the outside. Uh, and then if we have these free building systems, which have a little bit different qualities, 
uh, both are used and both are needed because they cover different types of the markets for timber buildings. And if we go into areas where we look at development at the moment with research and in the industry, most research is done together with the industry, you can say. We can say that one thing that we that they are studying is this, if you should use this uh, 3D volume elements or the planner elements, because they have different qualities depending on what you build. Uh, and we can say that for these 3D volume elements, which is a huge part of the market, they are really looking into platform systems. They want to, to have uh, a number of volumes that they use every time, but combined in different ways. Now, this means that the rooms look very much the same inside these but the outside can look different depending on where you put this building. Uh, so they are in some sense also then dependent on the production system. Uh, what is and will come here is a little bit more of mass customization to be able to change this a little bit more depending on who wants to use them. That's a trade-off between automation in the production and the uh, architectural freedom. The, uh, what is the limiting factor in size for this volume today is the transportation. They are not allowed to be wider than four meters a little bit about and 14 meters long. That's what we can transport on the lorry on the roads. So that's what you have to uh, play with if you're building like this. Often you get quite thick floors here. And here, of course, you have the roof on one volume and then you have the floor on the other structure both about 250 millimeter so you get a floor thickness of about 500 millimeters if we go over to the planner elements you have a little bit uh, greater freedom in your system you don't need to work with just squares you can also use other shapes as you can see in that uh, plan building plan to the right uh, so you have a little bit more freedom but as you can see, a lot of these rooms are still square in the same way as for the volume elements. Uh, here you can have a single span, six to eight meters, something like that. Then we get problems with vibrations and acoustics in the floors. And also here we have a floor thickness that's almost 500 millimeter thick. Uh, so that's what we have to use. And in the production, so this 3D, so the production issue is something that is worked a lot with, how to get this uh, efficient. And if we do it resource efficient, hopefully also cost, cost efficient. So they use this platform principle with uh, standardized volumes that they want to use. Uh, and that also means that you get a quite fast design when you have decided on this and can take it out quite fast into the industry to actually produce it with this prefabrication. Uh, there's a lot of projects, both on the information structure here, how to move it along the value chain, but also a lot about how much automation and robots you should use in the industry here. And it's built on quality and that you should have be able to work with uh, lean production principles within these factories and then increase the quality. It's easier to do that inside in a good environment with the right tools than it might be on the uh, out on the building site. And then you get a really fast assembly on the building site. Uh, the CLT in Glula, then you have more freedom how to design your buildings. Uh, what we have here is that the CLT, we have an often a maximum length of about 16 meters for an element. And then they are pre-cut and we have also uh, grooves for electrics and so on. So a lot of it is finished on the, in the factory on these elements. And you can erect the uh, load bearing structure quite fast in this system as well. 
but then you have more finishing work to do on the inside and the outside at the building site. In total, both systems probably take about the same from start to finish in the uh, from you start thinking about the building until it's standing on time on place. The prefabrication needs more time before you start production. The uh, more building on site project takes more time on site. And then, of course, we work with a lot of questions. If we talk timber engineering, we talk about stability. Uh, we are trying to develop better uh, models for how to calculate this 3D action on the elements here. Uh, and we can also say, now I'm talking a lot about research and development. And I would have to say that this is talking in general for the Swedish environment, not that it's done by RICE alone, it's done in many cases by universities and the industry. So this is a general presentation of happening in Sweden. Uh, what we are looking into regarding the, the planner elements and the glue lamp, it's a lot about the connection times and connection types and how to do fast assembly on this. Uh, the CLT still uses, as well as the glue lamp, a lot of screws that has to be pre-drilled and screwed into place. And it takes a lot of time on the building site. So we're looking into, and in it's looked into different types of connections to be faster in on the building site and to make it easier to do it correct. Yeah. There are also movements to look into higher degree of prefabrication again of these building systems to not do so much on the building site. This is something that uh, switch a little bit between years, what is important. In the beginning of the uh, in 2000, when we started to build with CLT, there was a lot, quite higher degree of prefabrication on this than we it was scaled back to be more efficient to clean CLT elements. And today they are trying to go back a little bit to higher degree of prefabrication again. Again, other issues that are looked into. Acoustics and vibration is one of these issues that has been a lot of uh, discussion about for timber. It's the impact sound when you hear people walking on the floor above that has been the issue, which is the one that you have to spend some time to solve. And in Sweden, we have requirements to measure frequency so down to 50 hertz. And we are discussions about going down and measure even lower frequencies, because we know that it's in these frequency ranges that we have this impact sound from people walking. So that's something that's changing, but that also means we need to find new ways of measuring this. So there is a lot of research ongoing regarding this. And we also know that we have to use quite uh, high floor structures, which is a limitation in some parts when we have limitations on building height in cities. So here is a lot of research ongoing, especially maybe on calculation methods and how to can we predict this with a little bit better uh, accuracy than what we do today. Oh. And we have questions about moisture safety. Of course, we have rain up here in when it uh, for large part of the year when the rain comes in from the Atlantic and so rain and moisture, and then in the next step, healthy buildings is one of the main issues also for uh, discussions in Sweden. And here it's really important to do the correct design to make sure that the water stays out of the building. And you need to do moisture design, especially since we know that it can rain every week. Uh, we need to make sure that we protect our buildings 
during the building process. In this case, you see one example where we actually use a tent over the structure to make sure it doesn't rain on it. Uh, that is still an exception. It's not done for all cases. In this case, it's a prefabrication system with 2D planner elements, which means it's open, but with uh, insulation and gypsum and so on on the buildings, which is not doesn't like rain on them. So there it's necessary. So we need to design the building process to make sure we don't get too much water into the structure. And so it's a lot about how to design the process here, you can say, and how to check it on arrival, how to store the material. And then there's also looking into the movement in service due to this, what happens when uh, the moisture content changes. And down to the right, you can see an example where uh, the uh, settlement of the building was has been measured for many years. It's a project run by Linnaeus University, where they have measured the settlements of this six-story buildings in CLT in this case, which has a total settlement for these six stories that you see there of about 20 millimeters. And it is changing a little bit about over the year, depending on how moist the air around the building is. And then, of course, we have the fire safety, which is an important area as well. That's where we have done a lot of work in Sweden during the years. And we have a technical guideline that was partly at least written from Sweden, this technical guideline about fire safety in timber buildings. It tells you a little bit how you should design this and show you some of these calculation models and tools, how to calculate uh, for fire and so on. Uh, in general, we use a lot of gypsum wall boards to avoid that it starts to uh, fire in the structure. Uh, there's, of course, also research projects in the whole of Europe today looking into how much does the fire stops by itself in uh, CLT structures when it's starting to burn because of this charring and there's no more air coming into the fresh wood and so on. So there are huge tests ongoing on that. Uh, and of course the insurance question about this. Uh, we are also discussing when and how to use sprinklers in this case. Uh, in Sweden, we are allowed to build as high as we want to today uh, in the, uh, build in the uh, structural system, but you have to make sure that it doesn't uh, uh, start a fire in the structure, which is if we go over eight stories is often done by sprinklers. And then we have the question about facades, where we are not allowed to use timber facades for taller buildings at the moment. And then, of course, we are looking into tall timber buildings. Uh, the building you see on the right there is a building that's on its way up at the moment. It's a CLT building that will be 20 stories high when it's finished. And in this case, they use CLT in the towers in the end of the, this uh, building that you see here. You see the load bearing stability part of the building there with a lot of CLT walls, 20 stories high. Between these two CLT towers, there are prefabricated modules, which will be hotel rooms when this is finished, and which are prefabricated modules but with CLT walls in this case, so they can be stacked on that high levels. So there's a lot of looking into building systems that can be used for tall timber buildings. And then there's also a lot of questions when we don't really know at the moment yet. Uh, we have the stability issues with uh, vibrations and accelerations due to uh, the wind load. So here we run, uh, a uh, research project working with uh, measurements of some 
tall timber buildings in Europe, but also into how to do with them, calculate and design these buildings so they can fulfill this requirements. Uh, fire safety for tall timber buildings is of course also an issue that is looked into. And then acoustics show up in these as well. So these are development areas that we are working on. Uh, but we also actually use in practice, we do build like this at the moment. Uh, sustainability, of course, is an important area here as well as in many parts of the world. Uh, Sweden has a requirement that will have a requirement, you say, that from 2022, we, it will be necessary to do a life cycle analysis to show the CO2 emissions from the buildings and the energy requirements. Uh, at that time, next, from next year, it will only be you have to do this life cycle analysis. In a few years time, there will also be requirements on the levels of this for new buildings. Uh, in other parts of Europe, uh, this is already implemented with levels as well, which is driving the development in sustainability. Uh, if we look at development in this area, it's one of the issues is still this agreement on the boundary conditions and how to calculate the carbon stored in the forest is one of the issues discussed still, both in Sweden and in Europe. Uh, there is work ongoing on declare the properties, the environmental product development declarations for all products. So we actually have those. So we have the data to be used. And then, of course, we will need some good calculation tools. If, if we want to, we'll be doing these life cycle analysis for all types of buildings. We also need tools that can help with this. So that's an area where a lot of development and ongoing in taking the information from the drawings and get an automatic calculation of this life cycle analysis. And of course, here will take some time to get into some kind of agreement on which tool is the best and should be used and so on. Now we have talked, I've talked a lot about uh, plain timber buildings. In Sweden, we have built a lot of the things that has been built, has been built in just timber. Uh, that uh, is an, the reason is probably that we needed to learn how to build in timber before we can start to combine these materials. But the question that is increasing now is to actually use uh, hybrid structures where we use more than one material and use the materials in the right way. So as you see, and that is done both as composite action within one element, as in the floor structure you see down to the left. Uh, this is not that much used yet in Sweden with this uh, floor structure with concrete and wood. Uh, but what is used more at the moment is this composite structure that you see to the right, where you have a composite action between the elements, where you see two stories in concrete and an elevator shaft in the middle that is helping with the stability of this building. And then you build the rest of it in timber around that. I think that one is, will be coming first and you can see example that's already used. But this is something I believe will be increasing with time to actually use the material where they are the best. And then an area which has not been looked into so much for timber in Sweden is this with circularity and uh, how to make sure that our material is used for a long time. Uh, this has increased as an area of interest in the last couple of years, we could say, and where we can see that we are working with this uh, in 
different ways. Uh, we are looking, there are projects looking into uh, how to deal with circularity and you reusing the material before use, meaning to design the structure so that it can be reused when it's taken down in a long time from now. So we have, and then we have also products that look into this during use. So we can increase the lifetime of the main structure here, either by changing the facade as you have down to the left, which is a project, or by vertical extensions as you see up to the right, where you have re, uh, built a few more stories atop of an old concrete building in this case. And then we have the last part, which is about after use, when you take this down, you will need to do a lot of quality control of the material. Uh, that is not that much done at the moment. Uh, so here, this is the area that will really be driving the uh, development in the years to come from now. And then and, uh, there are countries in Europe that are ahead of us in this case, definitely. That has a lot more of reuse already today. But if we want to do this, there is also a great need for development of business models. Uh, it, if this should happen, which is necessary from a, a, a re, a resource point of view, we also need to look into business model, how to make money of this. And, all righty. All right. Sorry about that, everyone. A little bit uh, um, abrupt in, in pausing just because of uh, we, we appear to have lost the sound <laughs> from our colleague um, who is in, in the most reliable internet connection um, in the Eastern Seaboard, I dare say, um, perhaps uh, Parliament House. Um, but uh, <laughs> in any case, we, we got through the vast majority of the presentation. I can tell you, um, just to finish things off, Marie was going to discuss um, a recent uh, innovation and, and collaboration uh, between industry and um, academic organisations and the government um, to look into smarter housing into the future. So moving forward, I'd, I'd love to welcome um, David Byland, uh, who, who is, as you can see, Director and Architect at TMBR Consult, um, and Paolo Levici, who is, of course, my colleague at the uh, Midrise Advisory Program at Wood Solutions, um, for joining us for a quick questions and answer um, sort of panel. Um, I can see we've got some really interesting questions which have come in, so we'll, we'll get onto those in just a minute. But uh, before jumping to that, I'd be interested to, to hear from David. Um, what, what was your sort of uh, response to the presentation and, and what's your experience with um, uh, timber construction in Sweden? Yeah, thanks, Lawrence, and um, good morning to everybody who's attended this. Um, look, that was a great presentation. Uh, no, no specific details as such, but a really good overview. Um, and uh, so I was quite pleased to see um, that she covered off on all three types of typical timber construction technologies in uh, planar, uh, mass timber, volumetric, um, and the post and beam as well. Um, you know, it's a fantastic presentation. Interesting to see a little bit of an update as well on the progression or the percentage of number of mid-rise timber buildings that are, are happening. So I think she quoted a figure of around about 20% of all mid-rise buildings uh, in the multi-res are now timber. Um, when I was doing my research into this and uh, spent 12 months nearly in Sweden based um, uh, at a university in Stockholm, uh, they were approaching that figure then. So it looks like it's about stabilised, which I think is quite an interesting factor in its own right because um, we need to find the right timber, the right uh, technology and the right supply chain to um, allow timber to sit comfortably within our own supply chain. Um, I don't think anybody's proposing that it's going to be a wholesale um, takeover of the construction industry. Um, it's going to sit comfortably in its own spot relative to our supply chain, uh, our codes uh, and you know, in our building capabilities. So that was quite an interesting to see that it seems to have settled in about 20%. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was very interesting to see. It, it seems there's a lot of parallels between what, what's happening in Sweden and, and you know what we've been doing in Australia, but they're just... You know, just a little bit ahead, a little bit ahead, a long way ahead in, in a lot of areas. 
Um, but it is interesting that, you know, we come up across the same sort of questions and, and we're all working on the same thing, really. No matter where you are in the world, um, it's for the same questions that are, that are sort of coming up. Um, Absolutely. Paolo, would you like to say anything on the, the video or should we jump straight to questions? Well, that's okay. Just one comment, as you may all uh, certainly and easily imagine, the diffusion of uh, stud frames for the walls in Sweden has not just been dictated by the uh, lessons learned from uh, uh, low rise construction, but also from the much, much higher need for insulation that they do have with respect to more uh, milder climates. So this is why they did develop uh, particularly well and as much as possible and as tall as possible the use of stud frames so we can learn from that uh, mm. also as well mm. yeah absolutely I, I thought that was very interesting in the level of prefabrication that they take it to as well and, and you know mm. as, as she was saying gypsum and insulation and and really finishes on on the panels before they go in on site which of, of course yeah. um results in other <laughs> other sort of requirements for construction and uh, weather protection. But, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah. Sorry, Paula, I'm just uh, also, she pointed out that um, the vast majority of buildings that utilise timber uh, in them is uh, in that you know, five and six storey max range. Mm -hmm. And um, if we think about the context in Australia, yes, it's exciting to build these tall timber buildings and um, the long span ones and commercial builds, but the reality is um, with the densification of our cities uh, in the ring around the inner parts of our, our densest parts of our cities, typically they're going to be four and five storeys, which is the sweet spot for lightweight frame. And that's the area that I think um, our supply chain needs to be really focusing on to, to continue to gear up to be able to supply efficiently and um, competitively in that space, because that's where we're going to see the most activity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, beautiful. So we'll jump into questions because there are a couple of really good ones and, and that has received quite a few upvotes. Um, and uh, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, David, and, and of course, Paolo, if you'd like to come in, please do so. Um, but the first question is from Lisa Ottenhaus, who's asked, uh, the floor thickness seems to be higher uh, than what we often see in Australia. Uh, is this due to acoustics or material strength? Um, you know, is it something to do with density or um, it, it, do you, what would be your response to that, David? Um, the floor thickness, well, it would be a response to the higher acoustic requirements that they have in Sweden. Um, I noticed you had a slide up there showing the difference between uh, a lightweight frame floor um, or, or a mass timber floor. And um, the mass timber floors generally do tend to be a bit thicker because you've had to add additional layers uh, of mass to try uh, mass on top of the mass timber. So whether it be um, screed of concrete or whatever. So um, yes, they do have slightly higher acoustic requirements than we have. And I think they're a little bit more developed in their testing methodology. That being said, they are starting from a similar base that, that we are um, around the compliance where the compliance system itself has not been developed to um, best test a timber solution has been developed to test a concrete solution. Um, and so the testing regime itself, I think, needs to be updated and modernised to um, better capture the real performance of a timber building, whether it be lightweight or, or mass timber. Yeah. Another thing that I noticed is that she was talking about six metre span. So also in our conditions, if you want to, to span six metre, and run some horizontal services, you will end up to similar overall depths. So what we tend to do is specialize a little bit the floor depth with respect to the area. So wet areas, bathroom and kitchens where you need some horizontal services, uh, we use the eye joists or the trusses. And then in bedrooms and, and lounges where we don't need those uh, big diameters, we tend to, and we have higher spans, uh, we tend sometimes to use CLT or, uh, or uh, joist, uh, LVL joist systems to reduce a little bit the overall floor depth. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so uh, suppose to, to continue along this theme of, of sort of uh, construction and specification, um, Colin McKenzie has asked a, an interesting question, um, which of course we've, we've received many times, um, which has to do with balconies and, and moisture protection. Um, and I suppose designed for durability in that sort of circumstance. Um, would you have any sort of uh, pointers or I know uh, Colin has mentioned preservatives um, or, um, you know, any sort of waterproofing barriers. Is there anything there which you, you'd um, sort of recommend, David? Um, hi, Colin. Uh, glad to see you've raised that point and um, probably a little bit of a loaded question, I suspect, because it is quite important and, and I know he's aware that this is an issue that, that can't be, shouldn't be overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, look, with balconies, um, the overarching aim should be to keep the timber dry and if it were, does get wet um, make sure that it can either dry out uh, naturally or it can be inspected from time to time. Uh, I'm fairly conservative when it comes to balconies on tall timber buildings uh, or taller buildings because um, if there is a breakdown in the membrane at any point um, and let's say for example you've got a CLT balcony cantilevering out um, or even a supported CLT bal balcony um, if there is a breakdown on the membrane uh, on the top surface, then yes, we potentially will have some challenges. Um, there are a couple of ways to deal with that. One of them is to treat the timber, uh, the CLT itself, before, or the timber before it's made into CLT. And I'm, I'm aware that there is some moves in the industry to supply that product. Um, uh, but I, the other option, uh, which I guess is the more conservative one, is to say, look, let's use the right material in the right place and not um, potentially put uh, a, a balcony at risk should there be a breakdown in that membrane um, and perhaps just leave the timber to the inside of the main envelope and use other materials cantilevering out or um, extending out some way. Um, so some of the more traditional materials, steel or concrete. And the same problem is for flat roofs. Uh, so what we tend to do is to create a fall also in the balconies to use two membranes, one of which normally is liquid, more fluid, and, and really covers very, very well and penetrates a little bit in any uh, little uh, differences in, in depth between the boards, for instance, uh, or splits between the boards. And the other one is a, a fiberglass reinforced membrane, which uh, takes the wear action. So certainly this is a point that requires attention in detailing, but it has been done successfully and with uh, good durability. So with a good, good detailing, it can be done. Yeah. What they do is then often, they uh, and mentioning what David was saying, often they hang out the balcony instead of cantilevering it. That's a very good solution. They hang it out. Uh, a project that I'm um, working on at the moment, and um, some of you will know that I'm involved in multi-story car park design um, and utilizing timber in that those types of structures. And um, the the current school of thought, I guess, that um, I'm trying to develop further is a uh, timber concrete composite for the floors. Um, so utilizing a concrete um, slab uh, that's in, uh, got timber components in it. So, um, uh, but our approach even with that is um, to recommend that the top story, it's an open car park, the top story itself has a roof um, on it to protect even that, that component because um, we just want to make sure that, um, that we'd have no risk um, there, there actually is some benefits to that because um, there's technology now uh, around solar panels which can both generate electricity uh, and also act as a membrane uh, and a shade structure all in one. So there is some, some benefits to um, working with current technologies and, and innovations in this space that, so, uh, that do several jobs at once, keep our timber dry, yeah, good. Uh, prefer a better amenity for the actual users and generate electricity. Yeah, what a good good point to sort of end on. So uh, we've just hit 12 o'clock, so unfortunately we have to wrap things up. But, but thank you so much, David, for, for joining us. Um, of course, everyone who's uh, currently in attendance, David's details are on the screen. And if you'd like to read his PhD, um, yeah. which is all about, um, the, well, it, it can't go into detail here, but of course, uh, timber construction, um, the, the link is on this slide. Um, 
Now, just for everyone else, uh, and also thank you very much, Paolo. <laughs> um, so uh, amongst all of other Wood Solutions resources, of course, I'm sure you're aware of our YouTube channel. Um, this recording will be uploaded to the YouTube channel uh, within the next week or so. Uh, but in the meantime, if you're interested to learn more about how these different products are made, about acoustic design, about a, a range of other uh, sort of topics, um, make sure to have a bit of a look at that page. You can obviously jump in and search for Wood Solutions on YouTube, or you can just scan that QR code right there. And then our next webinar um, will be in a, a couple of weeks' time um, with the team who were involved with the design and delivery of the student accommodation at ANU, or the Australian National University. Um, Banner Hall, an incredible project, um, very, very large scale, obviously with academic timeframes, so very <laughs> tight timeframes, um, and really a successful project. So uh, it'll be well worth tuning in for that one as well in a couple of weeks' time. Obviously, keep an eye on your, on your emails and um, make sure to jump on the Wood Solutions website and you can find the, the uh, registration link on the events page there. So one final time, thank you so much to everyone for, for attending. Thank you, Paolo and David, um, for your time this morning. It's been brilliant. Um, there's some really good questions there, which we'll try and uh, get back to you individually on. Um, but uh, and I suppose beyond that, until next time, we'll see you later.